Oh yeah. Matrix sweat. Cha 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 cha. Smells like coffee. <laughs> I don't think you very often have the opportunity, frankly, to read something and go, you know something, this could really impact how we view a particular genre. Yeah, I think this has that opportunity and I think people will mimic it. Here they come, ladies and gentlemen, from Chicago, Illinois, the Wachowski Brothers! I think the Matrix revolution has begun and continues to grow as, as time goes by. We were really fortunate that Warner Brothers let us uh, put the whole creative team of Matrix 2 and 3 under one roof. Andy and Larry are in casting and uh, everybody else is running around like crazy trying to get it together. It's still early on. We're actually testing some physical fights and we'll be shooting some special effects for Matrix 2 and 3. Well, we're preparing for the next two films, which means we are trying to flush out what the film will look like. We're trying to organize head castings for the actors so we can design glasses and helmets and head things for them. We've got the concept artists working on the movie. It's about five times as big and 10 times as difficult to to paper. Today we're uh, we're training. It's uh, the second week. Mr. Weaving, Agent Smith is over there learning how to fly punch. There he goes. We got a long way to go. You know, with two films, is twice as much as you would normally get on a film, and these two films are are more complex than the first film. When we made the first picture, nobody really knew we were doing. We were kind of under the radar. Um, the only people that really had a sense of the movie were Larry and Andy Wachowski. But I don't know how those guys stuck it out as long as they did because it was going to be made, it wasn't going to be made. The first Matrix, we were in, a, in Burbank in a kind of, uh, I don't even know what it was, the empty warehouse. And we didn't have anything there. We didn't have a coffee maker there. Or, um, we certainly didn't have trailers or anywhere that we could actually sit and change. There was like one bathroom. And there was a tiny little office with a couple of people running around and it seemed very uh, dinky compared to this. Yeah. Sort of like difference between working at NASA and working uh, in a, like a cave. Well, I remember, I mean, it was like a big accomplishment to get a drawing board. Just to get them to write a check at that time early on for a drafting table was a commitment that they weren't willing to make. And now we have this, you know, really wonderful facility. It's really a dream come true. This time around, we go in with, to some extent, a cult fan following, which is the greatest type of, you know, encouragement that you could have. There's a lot less uh, anxiety about whether or not we will be able to 
execute a lot of the choreography. We've been through it, so we're not, you know, sort of flying in the dark like we were the last time. We know how hard it's going to be, so it's, um, we know the challenges we have ahead of us. Well, the thing about it, and it was, it was true of the first one as well, is that, uh, you know, I, I love the material. You know, I love the material. I love, uh, I love the character, and, and, and I love who I ended up working with. So that is something that, regardless of what has to happen, that's just uh, that's the thing that kind of gets me through it. A friend of ours asked us to come up with a concept for a comic book. We didn't have any concepts. Started thinking about something. Came up with the, the whole shebang. Every idea we've ever had in our entire lives is in this one film. And it's like a band's first album, the director's first film. They've thought about it for a long time. They really put their heart and soul in it. When I first read The Matrix, it, there was a great deal about the, the, I don't know, the Eastern influence, the comic book influence that had been meshed into kind of Western philosophy. A synthesis from the literature, from the exposure that they've had in cinema, from their lives, from uh, from what they're interested in, from what they find funny, from what they find cool. We like kung fu movies. We like we like Japanimation. We like Japanimation. We like you know John Woo Gabe movies and books that are you know science fiction that is about the sort of nature of reality. They really have a grasp of philosophy of of all t types of philosophy, of Eastern philosophy, of, of, you know, European philosophy. Mayor and Andrew said, okay, we'd like you to play Thomas Anderson, Neo. I had to read Baudrillard. I had to read uh, Out of Control, which was about systems, evolution, robots. And then there was another book, which was uh, Evolutionary Psychology. Those were three books that they wanted me to uh, read before I even opened up the script. Well, I mean, I, I guess for myself, to play Thomas Anderson, he was searching for the truth to his life. He felt that something was wrong. He felt like he was not having real contact. He was searching for something. He was searching. He felt that there was something behind the veil. You ever have that feeling where you're not sure if you're awake or still dreaming? Mm, all the time. And he was looking. So he was looking for tr Morpheus to try to, to break that veil. And I guess that that is something that... Um, Baudrillard spoke about sometimes, but not in searching for something, but in what got in the way. Baudrillard's ideas of uh, simulacra, simulation, is an important point within the film, and that what we see in the film as a, a real object is in fact often a simulation. He does one chapter, I believe, on like religious icons, where the icon starts to represent God and it loses its power of a true connection to God because then you're with the icon and then you have a simulation of an icon until it becomes on the dashboard of your car. You know, a decay of meaning. You look at a place like Las Vegas where they're it's building a the casino. The power of simulate, you know, the simulacra. Like, you know, it's a very relevant, very modern, important issue that Youngsters like us are noodling about. I read the Matrix script and really flipped out for it. Thought it was fantastic. Um, thought that uh, as a script, uh, the first 40 or 50 pages were the best 40 or 50 pages I'd ever read. Uh, and then I got very confused. We went into the first Warner Brothers story meeting and. Uh... They said, okay, now we know we've bought something cool. We don't know what it is. Could you just take us through it once? <laughs> when I first read that script, I went, wow, am I in the Matrix or am I in the real world? Kind of, how do I get my head around all this? I have to say, I didn't understand the script. I mean, I understood the script well enough to say I liked it. But every time I reread it and every time we got closer, I understood more and more and more and more. I had questions forever and they would have constantly tried to change their plot and they were now Bill, 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 you just don't understand. <laughs> I have no idea why people who've read this script of the first Matrix found it confusing. I don't get that at all. Upon reading the script and seeing the conceptuals, you know, at the same time, 
you know, the immediate reaction is, um, there's no chance in hell this movie will be made. There's a whole slew of these scenes I see being chopped out or left on the floor. There's just too unlike a, a large studio to, to take a chance on something that is that seems very alternative. You know, I've said to people often that, you know, a movie this smart, um, it's almost a miracle that it got made because it is so smart. It took me a lot of a lot of readings and a lot of conversations with everybody to fully understand the script. But I just remember thinking, I mean, they don't really think I'm gonna do this stuff like running like jumping from one building to another. I was like, well, no, of course I'm not gonna do that. And like running side lo sideways along a wall. It's like, cause everything was really specifically put in the script. They want you to understand what you're gonna see. And particularly in an action movie, it's very hard to do that because people aren't either used to reading it or they don't wanna write it, you know? And you know, the legendary story is, you know, you'll see in a Western, you'll see you know, one-eighth of a page and the Indians take the fort. That one-eighth of a page, the Indians take the fort, could take a month or two of shooting if you're gonna, but you know, that's the director and the stunt coordinator, everybody gets together and plans how the Indians take the fort. When these boys explain the helicopter sequence or when they explain in the new movies, the car chases, when they explain that stuff, they're very clear of what you're seeing which A, makes it very, it makes it easier to budget than just the Indians take the four because you know where you're going. It makes it easier to see what's gonna happen so it's easier to understand the picture. And it's also great because they know what they're doing. Well, it's funny. I mean, one of the great things about them is, is they, how, how uh, idealistic and ambitious they were when they sold us the Matrix. You know, they said, look, we have this trilogy. Um, I said, well, let's just try to figure out one movie, guys. It'd be great to get the three, but let's try to one. They said, we want to direct it. And, I, and at the time, I said, look, you know, I don't know. I'm going to have a hard enough time explaining to people what it is we're going to try to make here. Now to try to sell you guys as first-time directors and this size scale with this kind of complexity, that you're asking too much of me, really. I, I don't know how to deliver that for you. So they wrote Bound. I'm trying to seduce you. Why? There was one scene in it, which was the sex scene, and they wrote in it, this is the sex scene, and we're not cutting it. And they wrote it in a script, and I, this is, I, I like that. I like that it's funny, it's a little bit naive, and it's also tough. It was fun because it was a low-budget movie, and we did the temp music ourselves. You know, we came up with stuff, and, and I cut it all in, and we, we, we really worked hands-on together very closely for a long time, and created this little, what to me is a little jewel of a movie. I, I love Bound. I remember when I showed uh, Terry Semmel um, Bound, he was so impressed with it because they had just made a picture here called Diabolique that was uh, not that effective. And I remember Terry said, God damn it, I said, this thing probably cost a fraction, he was talking about Bound, a fraction of our picture and it's so much more interesting and exciting and God, those guys are good. So that was the desired response. At the end of Bound, uh, when we were totally exhausted and we were, I think it was our last day, they said, hey, uh, hey, Pope, you want to do a $100 million movie next? I said, no, absolutely. I don't think you should do a $100 million movie. And even if you do, I don't want to do it. Because I know that the more money you have, the more heat rains down on you. How are these guys going to make the jump from a $5 million movie to a $65 million movie? And I was afraid for them. I kept trying to talk him into, let's do a $20 million movie, let's do a $10 million movie, let's work our way up, and uh, they didn't listen to me, thank God. I remember thinking, well, that's a lot of money, well, they went from Bound to this big movie, and I know Bound was so great, but, you know, a lot of times it doesn't happen, studios aren't that um, trusting with people, and after spending um, an hour with them going through the storyboards, I, I totally understood why someone would trust them. So few people understood the uh, original script that they decided to storyboard the whole thing so they could explain it. Nobody really understood, you know, the, the level of the action or the, the level of detail that we wanted in the action sequences and the conceptuals. So what they really wanted to sort of jazz them about was, you know, the action sequences which were 
you know, like I said, very Hong Kong and comic book influenced. You know, comics are graphic type storytelling when you can freeze a moment and make an image that sort of sustains, and, you know, has a kind of power. You can't really do that in film either. We, we tried to do that. They love comics and they, they, they worked in the world of comics. They wrote the first comic book that I ever got a chance to work on way back when my big break in comics and was called Ecto Kid. And I remember going and watching them do storyboards early on and they would act it out and the, they and the storyboard artists would look you know, they, this is the frame, and you can see they're drawing from life then. They're not drawing things that can't appear. They're there for every shot. They don't, I don't ever just get a script, sit in a room, and come up with a bunch of stuff and say, hey, what do you think of this? They, you know, they go over every shot that they want. What Larry and Andrew are doing sometimes is examining. They'll take an idea, and they'll see different sides of it, flip it around. Just look like, and that's even what their camera does. Here's an event. What does it look like over here? What does it look like, like from over here? Well, this is neat. This is interesting. The immediate result of their comic background is that their their storyboards were were far more dramatic, and the the moments that they select to actually draw the snapshot in time is often right on the head. The most maddening, the most you know emotionally evocative. The whole notion of storyboards and what the Wachowskis do are just there's no. There's no compatibility to that. These are paintings. They are, you know, they're master drawings. Jeff Darrow came aboard and did a lot of the conceptual work. I only knew uh, two comics of Jeff's before. Uh, one of them, a legendary comic, Hard Boiled, of course, and then Big Boy, uh, which was not so famous, but Hard Boiled among comics people is pretty well known. I had Hard Boiled on my shelf like millions of other people and all i could assume was that the man behind that was the most demented individual on the planet you know i was expecting some guy you know with um you know covered in tattoos and piercings i assumed he was uh you know a very skinny scrawny methamphetamine abuser when morpheus tells neo he has to free his mind you don't gotta say that to jeff jeff's Jeff's mind is free. <laughs> I mean, he's out there. I remember they'd tell me one guy wanted to know what kind of drugs I was taking. Sominex and uh, Metamucil. They'd seen some, some drawings that I did that, that could have corresponded to images they had, especially with the sentinels and the, the robotic part of it. And I th think they said that they liked the level of detail that I put in drawing. You draw so many details that it becomes um, serene. At the same time, inside it, in every section of it, is madness. In many ways, Jeff is wired to Larry and Andy's brain. I mean, they're, they're all wired on the same circuit. And during the entire period, you know, they were always, oh, I hope we can get this in there. I hope we have the budget for this. And I hope this looks the same. And at that point, I had no real experience in storyboards. And, I had no idea how closely that they were going to get followed. I was amazed that they got everything as exact as they had wanted it. It's right out of their brains. What we had to do really with the, with the film was to establish, I think visually, the difference between the Matrix and the real world. Our job was to differentiate the two worlds in as quiet a way and as pervasive a way. So it took you someplace, but not in a in-your-face manner. In the Matrix, everything was slightly decayed. Everything was slightly monolithic and grid-like, like a machine would make it. And you're noticing things like the interrogation room or the government office. There are grids on the walls, there's grids on the floor, there's even grids in the ceiling. And so we're hoping that that will convey a feeling of artificial control, if you like. Owen and I collaborated a lot on the strength of the tones of green in the Matrix. Also talked with Bill about, you know, when the light hits a certain fabric or a certain leather or how I could make it pick up green or how I could make it pick up different colours. 
in the neb we wanted it to be much more about the human beings and so we we used you know longer lenses and sort of let the backgrounds get all sort of soft and uh, have the humans stand out more and more. Their clothing is a little more humane and cloth-like and their makeup is more natural and their hair is more natural. They're less styled. It was a very hand-hewn world as opposed to the Matrix. Also, they're a mercenary group of people, so they have more on their minds than fashion, you know. The Matrix would always have like a green bias to it. Whereas in the real world, we went for a blue bias and we avoided green, except for Tank's console on the Nebuchadnezzar, which has got green code in it, which is, of course, a matrix. So all of those things, which might not seem a great deal to anyone else, for anyone who's actually kind of work out the nuts and bolts of the film, it's, they're kind of like re revelations, if you like. You know. I guess my job is to try and create the environments for Larry and Andy and the actors to sort of work them in. What he did, what, what, you know, Australia, the whole art department pulled off, and is it's, most people won't believe it, I don't think. The largeness, the hugeness, the sort of complex set after complex set after complex set, and I built them all. They're all beautiful, they're all totally realistic. I think his um, design was so so spectacular that he even surprised Larry and Andy and he kind of went further than they had uh, imagined. That's real credit for him. We've sort of fallen back a great deal onto uh, and utilised, as Larry and Andy wanted us to do, uh, a lot of Jeff Darrow's drawings, which were the original conceptual thing. The, turn, the case of turning a lot of Jeff's fantastic ideas into reality have meant some adaptions to because we deal with gravity and not just a piece of paper. But uh, essentially we're trying to sort of evoke that sort of world that um, he's developed, which is kind of cool. Well, I would say it's, you know, also being derivative of Jeff Darrow's demented imagination were fascinating to look at. Most of them I wanted to turn into a nightclub after uh, the film was done. I think sometimes building sets is like the Matrix itself. On one side is plywood, and then you walk through a doorway, and there's another world. <laughs> Just being the Matrix, I mean, there's a kind of like simulation to every object. That's kind of the illusion of the Matrix in itself, you know. Simulacra simulation was very much the case. Basically, my job is to take the script and show people who the characters are by what they wear and why why they would wear them in an, in the environment in which they're placed. Should we go to Lawrence next? Yeah. We've got two different two different <laughs> kind of looks. The directors come to the second fitting and then we iron out things like can you do kung fu? Can you hang from the ceiling upside down so we don't see up your dress? You know, we work out all the practical considerations and I might use three different types of fabric for the same costume so one might look the same but be stretchy because I have to put it over harnesses or body armor or you know bullet hits or whatever visual effects if you do it right should be a part of the conceptual process because if you are going after the unseen then planning the unseen uh, should involve the visual effects design. And Larry and Andy understood that right away, so they brought me in. It went during this, this time of development. We were speaking before of the sort of impact that comic books can have in terms of their frozen graphic moments. What we really like about slow motion is that it sort of brings some of that quality to, uh, to action scenes. But what we also like is we like to move the camera. So we, we started off and we had this concept of shooting something in slow motion and moving the camera at regular speed. And Bill Pope, the, the pussy, <laughs> wouldn't strap a rocket to his back. The discussion was we put a rocket on, you know, on, a, on a dolly so that it zooms real fast. Well, that wasn't really practical. 
because you know uh, uh, you wouldn't really be able to focus and see the see the the, the the shot. So it had to be some sort of effect. Somewhere along the line, they connected up with John Gate. I don't know how. When we started preparing the first movie and started looking for a visual effects crew that would work with us, and we went to all the you know usual suspects. We went to ILM. We went to Digital Domain. We went to all these entities that are are you know well thought of in the in the world of visual effects gated was not part of that group i mean he was outside that world you know they showed their boards a few places each time that they had done that they they tended to uh, have a similar reaction faces turned white or some a proposal for a physical camera invention that would ev effectively end up with the camera exploding because it would have to move too fast. It would be, you know, uh, connected to a rocket sled or something like that in order to achieve their shots. John's idea was to replace it with hundreds of still cameras so that that's really what a moving image is, is a hundred still images. He can make it look like a motion picture image rather than a still image. Bullet time is basically like mind over matrix moment or a moment where we can see, you know, time in, you know, the speed of light or the speed of sound. But I remember the first test I saw was an exploding trash can, and he froze the flames and the explosion in, in midair and moved the camera all the way around it. Yeah, bullet time was really the technical hurdle, but the, uh, the conceptual, you know, not to crack was the portrayal of the real world, which was, oddly enough, the most bizarre part of the movie, which turned out to be the place where, you know, horrendous, hideous, biomechanical beasties lived and ruled and enslaved mankind and, and all of those things. I tried drawing the Sentinels and I didn't get what they wanted. And they called in a couple other guys and they had them do it and they couldn't get it. And I talked to them a little bit again. I said, let me have one more shot at it. And uh, I drew it really, for me, reasonably fast. I drew it one morning, because they were going to Warner's. And I, they said, I, I got it. And that was the basis for what the Sentinels turned out to be. So I was real happy, because I think they're like the villains in the movie. And it's nice to have a piece of that. No good. <laughs> We're hoping to shoot the kung fu the way that Hong Kong guys do, which is to have the real actors exchange four, five, six punches to choreograph the fight like a dance, let it sort of happen in front of people instead of just creating it in the editing process. And that required all of the actors, all the four major actors anyway undergo some massively intense study with we think one of the best Hong Kong choreographers, Yun Wu Ping. Hong跟香港如果演員我們在平時拍一般動作片 Larry and Andy kept saying to me, we want the actors to actually be able to do the kung fu. We want them to do it. You know, I would say to them, you know, what's the big deal? Let's get the people who can do the kung fu. But the boys were convinced that they wanted to see these actors doing those things themselves. Actors always bring more to the believability of it than a, a stunt person is, no matter how good they are. If you can raise the actors up to the level of the stunt people in the action, then you've got the best of both worlds. 開始兩兄弟已經認識了四個月的時間訓練了 how demanding we thought the film was going to be. And we were just hoping that, that someone would be crazy enough to do. 
I had no idea what we were in for. You know, they said four months of training. I said, okay. When I first talked to Larry and Andy, they said, you know, there'll be, there'll be lots of training, kung fu training, and are you okay with that? And I said, yeah, sure, that's no problem, no problem at all. And, and I guess I didn't really think about it enough. I totally knew because I screen tested for three hours doing this stuff. This was part of my screen test, was three hours of what we do, straight, without like other actors to have the time so that I can have a breather. I'll tell you one thing, that first, those first two days kicked my ass. After the first day, I was so shattered and so shocked, and I realized I was so unfit, and we had so much to do. And I was working with these incredibly skilled Hong Kong performers who were looking at me like, He'll never get there. We started actually the last one on these bars. They had these bars and you just kind of put your leg up. As you, we would walk in and say, hey, Hugo, get your leg up. We'd all get our legs up. Get your leg up, Carrie Ann. Good morning, Kiara. Yes, get your leg up. And then you kick. Put some music on and you kick for about uh, 45 minutes. We're kicking and we're kicking and we're kicking and we're sweating and you're sweating and you're grunting and you're going, ow, ah, uh, you know, and the next day you come in limping. You know, Keanu made this decision and you know, went to what well, was arguably one of the toughest training periods for an actor in a modern film while he was recovering from surgery. It was neck. Yeah, coming into the training for the first one, I'd had a two-level fusion uh, in my uh, cervical spine. I, I was, my legs were getting, I was getting paralyzed. So I had the surgery done, um, and then it was just a waiting game, just to see if it would fuse. But it really hindered me a lot in training because I couldn't kick, I couldn't train kick for like two, two of the four months. Ah! It was devastating to like watch. Because I was always like, oh, uh, like it hurt me to watch. the choreographer was very nervous. And if you notice in the film, I don't kick that much. I do a couple of wire kicks, but I don't kick that much because I, I couldn't. The Chinese have this saying, you know, you pick a job you love, you never work a day in your life. We are, we're all, I mean, we're playing out there together, you know. There's, there's a lot of playtime that goes into this sort of hard work of the training process and the choreography and the fighting and all that. We, we have fun with each other. And Hen Wu Ping is largely responsible for setting that kind of tone. He's second generation. There's such a, a wealth of knowledge and experience. Him and, and the people that he works with are great teachers and, you know, instructors. Yeah, well, we basically had the basic structure, the big broad structure of how we wanted the fights to work. And then he just would rough in the fight. He'd do some things, we'd see him, we'd decide what we liked, what we didn't like. was just uh, being able to see the guys jump and hit. Jump and hit. And one, and the, and the two shot. Let's try it. Right. Out of this hit, I mean, we're... Is this just this a takeoff? This is just a two shot. Is this... And when he fly, he actually fly out of the shot. Uh, another one out of the shot, and then one shot, they, they hit each other. Ah, that's what he's thinking. That's what I thought he was thinking. All right, okay. So you want to see, see them hitting, a flying, hitting in one shot. Is that what you're thinking? That's what we were thinking. Too hard. Okay. So Oh, he said he doesn't have enough people to draw. Oh, guys. We'll get on there. Okay. Let's go. 
<laughs> Both Wu Ping and the Wachowskis are working on the shots. It's all videotaped. It's all worked out where the camera goes. And then basically they would start training the actors with the uh, with the team to learn those exact moves and they, they would just practice it over and over and over and over. You sure we don't move on that? Just stand still, huh? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Coming at you. Okay. I mean the dojo fight with Keanu and I, we I can't even tell you how many times we practiced that. And, like just the first part of it. You know, we spent like the first two months on just the first movement soon. He would look at us and develop with us, kind of collaborate with whatever our body styles were, what our style was. He'd let that develop. Lawrence 天路呢,就成大好看,好好好,想做好件事。Good. <laughs> Not too much pressure, but enough, right? So, yeah. Yeah. So. So, so. That's clean. <laughs> the American training. Oh, uh, good. It's uh, it seems um, ready to go to uh, Australia. Well, yeah, I think we were ready. I mean, I know I was ready. Let's go. Let's go. What do you Let's go. Sydney's a beautiful town, I gotta tell you, I've never seen nothing quite like it. Why well, it works, Chris? Good. Australia provided several things that were all related to economics that brought the cost of the film down quite dramatically. It's odd that uh, the studio was so hands-off with um, fairly new directors. I mean, they had done Bound, which was a great film uh, previous, and I'm sure they had confidence, but obviously the budget had uh, escalated quite a bit further than Bound's budget. We didn't have as much immediate supervision. And I actually believe that ultimately allowed a lot more artistic integrity. That's one of the reasons why we ended up going to Australia. I think the brothers knew instinctively that a long way away is better, especially for your first uh, big movie. Uh, no, we saw it as a way of making a movie. Making a movie. <laughs> right. Gone anywhere, basically. On the first day of the shoot, we had a, a kind of blessing, a Buddhist ceremony. We had a big pig, um, big feast. Let's get some fruit, some candles, some incense. Auspicious day. We've just started filming, and we now look forward to like five months of filming, and we're just like at the beginning. It's almost hard to imagine the end part of it. I 
felt like there was a really great excitement about it. I remember when we showed up meeting the people who were building the sets. It was in a new studio. You know, costumes were being built. We were getting ready to go. And it seemed like everybody who was working on the picture had a genuine enthusiasm and excitement about what they were working on. I was feeling really good. And then I got the news that my neck didn't fuse. And so we had trained. What we try to do is train for the train and then fight and then do the other, you know, and then train, have a chunk of time to train and fight. And so I was ready to go, and then they said, you can't fight. And I was like, uh, yeah. We knew that his neck was injured, and the schedule was backloaded action-wise so that uh, in the beginning of the schedule, Keanu could do quieter scenes, and as he became more healthy, he could do the harder fighting scenes. He needed to look ill at ease in his clothes, his suit at work, and kind of like someone who'd just woken up. So he was just a little bit dishevelled and nothing quite fit him properly. The brown coat, the brown jacket. Oh, it was fun. We went shopping for that. We went. Uh, I remember one of the first experiences I had with her was just going to uh, to a flea market and to an antique kind of flea market and just walking through it, and looking at because we saw some shapes that were that worked on me and didn't work. The most important part is the reveal. Yeah. And, and, and a bit of the giant of the box. Giant of box. Giant of box. Okay. Giant of box. What did they? Uh... Uh, you, you guys met Robert? Not yet. Uh, That's all right. Hey, this Larry. is Mr. Steady Can. Hey, and how are you, Robert? Right. Mr. Rice Family. The bailout guy. The parachute. That's what I... Save us. <laughs> <laughs> There's a good thing about. Two directors is they can act the movie out for you. So show him that shot again, guys. Just go frame up this stuff. This is this is a good thing about having two directors, I think. They can act out all the scenes and they can Action. show up. Oh, God. Somebody's going to be here. He's going to okay. We're going to have uh, somebody doing photo okay. copy. Nice to we'll see it and he'll, he'll say something. Stand by. Action. We figured a lot out, working with each other, and, and how we're gonna do. How we're gonna make this picture? Done. It. Perfect. Got them. Keanu's first trip back to uh, the Matrix. This is Keanu. Once his once the veil has been lifted from his eyes, the first time back in the Matrix. That's his trip in that car through Chinatown. Then I go for the jump and free my mind. I mean, I've sort of tried to free my mind and go for the jump. I learn I can die. And then I learn I can die in the net. <laughs> and then I find out that I'm not even the one. The thing that used to convince him before he was told the truth is now looks remarkably fake. So uh, green screen is too sophisticated a technique. We can make it look real. So I wanted to use something as fake as Hitchcock's old rear screen projection, the same way, you know, Cary Grant looks fake driving down those, the um, street in uh, North by Northwest. They got a pretty cool quality out of it. I mean, it's an unusual thing to do these days, true, but um, the colors were nice and saturated, and the, the sort of defocused nature of it made it very dreamy. Well, that was the first day I got to work with Mr. Fishburne. But you know what I loved about that scene, it was great, was that even with the knowledge that what his life had was, this kind of simulation, was that he's still fascinated by the technology of what the Matrix is. Well, Lawrence is perfect for his part because he has like a regal kind of bearing. We dressed him very formally because he is a formal character. He's like the guide through the world. Mm. Oh, nice. Good eye. Here we are. You know, 
Oz. And I've one question. Way Skippy. <laughs> I had an idea when the sequence with the cat, where you see the cat twice, and they talk about deja vu. Deja vu. So we decided to include that in the scene near the fountain to continue that idea of the Matrix was glitching. So we cast a lot of twins and triplets and where we could and then costumed them identically. And I don't know if many people would notice it, but we thought it was a good idea. Okay. You want to put some twins in this? I've got twins over there. I mean, yeah, yeah, we need How yeah. many twins do you want in here? Could you pull a few uh, couple of nuns, like right to the second row? Cut! The Matrix is a system, Neil. Monday. I will Sam. no longer just be a Sam. computer nerd. Sam. I will be a superhero. I can plug to stop it. Stop it. Oh. They agree on everything. How does that, how does that tell you what I think of your idea? <laughs> were you listening to me, Neil? Or were you watching The Woman in Red? Again. Yeah. Why are they holding this damn gun? It's like holding a brick. <laughs> so you liked this better than anything? Or just or nothing? Freeze it. Just freeze it. We'll try it clean and naked. Clean and naked. Freeze it. We're establishing everybody in these shots? Yeah, the order of events is. We're going to shoot the background with nobody in it whatsoever. Uh, uh -huh. Then we're going to shoot the, the fountain with a really closed down shutter, which means right. like when you shoot those water commercials and you want them like super crisp. Then we bring in the crowd. We shoot those guys for, for all the three angles. And while the people are walking to the frame, we're going to ramp the camera from 24 to 96. And in that moment, we're going to stop. We're going to pick a frame that looks crisp and digitally hold that frame for the rest of the scene. So everyone's like stuck. This isn't the Matrix? No. It's another training program designed to teach you one thing. If you are not one of us, you are one of them. I like playing villains if they have a sense of humor. And I think that was a key thing with, with Smith, was that I always thought he was funny. He amused me, and so it was much easier for me to, to enjoy playing him. We wanted to subconsciously convey like the idea of a secret agent look and the, that kind of 60s silhouette seemed to fit really well. You know, JFK undercover look seemed to be the right one. I was actually very excited when we got to do that scene because I felt for the first time I was actually acting. I was actually involved in, 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 in something that was um, gonna, gonna um, extend me, I suppose. Door. Cut. But suddenly after all these months and months of kind of preparing for something, I felt like I was actually involved in it. To work with Hugo Weaving like that was just, and to see what he was doing as Smith was so fantastic. As you can see, we've had our eye on you for some time now, Mr. Anderson. It seems that you've been living two lives. We tried to just go for a very neutral accent, but a more specific character. And the character kind of evolved that he kind of, I wanted him to be not 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 robotic but not really human and more like uh, I was I kept thinking about a, a 50s newsreader or someone like that it's Walter Cronkite it sounds like you know that's, and that's the way it is you know it's so great one life you're Thomas A Anderson program writer for a respectable software company and also, the more I hung out with Larry and Andy, the more I think I picked up on their rhythms. Larry and Andy both have an incredibly deep voice, and I think that kind of 
Agent Smith started to kind of talk a little bit like that as well. One of these lives has a future. One of them does not. Somebody said he was a, he was imitating us at one point. We fired them. <laughs> How about I give you the finger and you give me my phone call? To play what was going on, I kind of scared but also kind of the, the, you know, the kind of the, some of the chutzpah that Thomas Anderson has, you know, fuck you, man, fuck you. Yeah, I keep getting into this attitude when I do it, like the guy just turns into this guy. Like, man, I feel like I, also I feel like I'm like some 70s hippie guy. Do you know what I mean? I really feel like you like two short turns into that. And then, of course, then to do the special effect and to have the mouth covered for five hours. Because I hadn't thought of how I would communicate that day, and all of a sudden I found myself. <laughs> kind of trying to find a pen. What? Get some papers. Right faster, we're on the clock here. <laughs> <laughs> Hit, resist. Swing at agents. Uh, they're pretty mighty. Action! You're going to help us, Mr. Anderson, whether you want to. That was a good day. That was a fun day. to go up on top of all those rooftops. You had to get the gear up there. You had to bring the gear down. I was excited. It was, uh, OK, here we are. How's this going to happen? What are we going to do? Can we do it? What's it going to be like? I feel that it's going to be good. Sometimes you've got to go with the flow. You know what flow is bad for Okay, and my candle do with one candle, two candle, three candle. So I feel like it's like we are under attack. I remember the first thing I had to do in the Matrix was a fork. Kick. Like, kick him in the head. I kick him in the head. I've been training for four months not to kick anyone in the head. Kick him in the head. Okay. Kendo Oh my gosh, in that first day we did it on the rooftop, I woke up with it, like my neck went out and I couldn't move and I was crying, you know, thinking, oh no, and they brought a masseuse over to get it out and we did it. Thank God for Advil. Oh, 
No, no, no. It's, it's going to be good. As this guy's pitching yeah, back, important. right? You got to reveal Trinity in the distance and Keanu close. Is it a thud or is it? It's a good test. Those things are sort of slow. If we shoot it, they should like go. And then fall out of it. Mate, could you uh, pull that out of my head, thanks? Uh, well, this isn't bullet time. This is bullet time action. That was the backup plan. We had not completed making the special rig that we knew we needed to do the real shot yet. We wanted to make sure that we had we could do that scene if the bullet time process didn't work. And we had all these rehearsals with stunt folks. You know, there was some rigidity about it, or there was like some, there was something about it that just felt clunky. And we were really worried that Keanu would would not be able to even go that far. We do one where he goes to and then try to start back the other way. And all of his performances were much more fluid. That there was this extra like inertia, you know, emotional inertia that that allowed him to stretch his body into that ultra limbo-like position. This one's first? Gun? I mean, the hit. Yes. Okay. 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 And you want this knee to come up? Yeah. Dodge this. Okay, let's complete chase, please. Any more to shoot? most bare skin of everybody so that you had that distinct difference between something black and shiny and kind of metallic looking and then somebody's flesh. We spent a lot of time experimenting with you know what different fabrics did in different types of light so that we could get Trinity really like a mercury oil slick. I spent a lot of time last um, time on the on the wires because I did I did wire work. It's challenging. And then all of a sudden you kind of like find your way with the wire and you feel like it's also very sore, like it hurts to be to do the wire. And but then you kind of find your way on it. Suddenly you're able to do things that that you didn't really think you could do. It, it's sort of more of your mind getting around it than anything. No one on the crew knew what we were doing. And when I'm running alongside a wall, and I really am running alongside a wall, you know, I remember the nurse being like, 
do you need Gatorade? I think she's, she's done too much. I'm like, no, I want to do it again. I want to do it again. It's just so exciting. Stunt people don't like work on wires all the time. You know, it's it's sort of a specialized thing. And so my stunt double just it just didn't feel right watching it. And so Larry and Andy were like, they turned around, looked at me, and I said, okay. Try it. Try a bit change. Yep. Yep. And I got up and did it. to move inside and make the government lobby seeing the world change. I give you the finger and you give me that finger. Once we shot and cut the government lobby, the cloud lifted and, and the Matrix had a voice and it became obvious that this was a movie unlike anything you'd ever seen before. There's this one sequence where they're panning with me as I'm running down with the guns. You know, they're, they're ba literally setting off a thousand bullet hits and moving five cameras. And I love that kind of, that moment where it's sirens go off and, you know, it's like, here we go, you know, and, and we got to shoot now and you got to hit it. They said, we need a foyer for an office building. And it's kind of like a mausoleum, you know. They wanted to be able to run along the walls. They wanted to be able to do cartwheels. So you obviously had a lot of wire work, so you needed to build a set that you could either access from the middle with wires or lower parts. Would you please remove any metallic items you're carrying? Keys, loose change. Holy shit! Oh. He needed clothes that would be practical within those actions. And he had a lot of guns to carry, and he had to conceal them. I wanted him to have a bit of a gun-slinging attitude. And then you just keep rolling. Ready? I wanted a very specific, very stylized approach to the destruction. Basically, we wanted to be able to have these concrete pillars be reduced to apple cores. Okay, Trinity time. I understood something very important that day during the government lobby. And that was the pressure that I had on my shoulders and that Keanu had on his shoulders. And I had never felt that before. One, two, three. Because I'd learned like running along the wall, but the cartwheel part is really hard. And so I had never gotten it right. I had just started to get it kind of right. And so I started rehearsing that morning and I started to get it right, you know? The stakes are higher, I guess. And then I hurt myself. I hurt my ankle. Ah! Oh no! Oh no! I remember thinking in the moment that I hurt my ankle that, oh my god, I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm down. But I can't be down. And then when I was told that it was just like one take and I just was like, okay, no matter what, I'm gonna be able to do this. No matter what, I'm gonna do this. No matter what, I'm gonna do this. It was very heavy. Yeah. So I'm leaning forward, right? Yeah. Sideways. Okay, straight. Go. Yeah. Right. Great. Let's do it. Okay. Yeah. 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 Y
，佢完全拍佢唔知咪緊張啦，成日都嗰個嗰個力有啲錯咗咯，嗰個就分咗第分咗嘅，一一走一翻再接佢，啊，即係變咗兩個鏡頭咯。See Keanu do that quadruple kick, and that they've been practicing for four months, and suddenly see it work. And we were, it was great, great moment. Yeah, forget the handstand, ancient history. Be here now. You gonna rehearse? Want to? Yeah. Well, I haven't kicked with the guns, and I haven't had the coat. Good idea. Let's check your frames. Let Reeves warm up. We would do it. It wouldn't be good enough. They would talk. Then uh, they come over and say, well, it would be good. You get it like this. And then we try again. It's the way it should be. You try it, you look at it, you do it, you talk. You know, know when to leave it alone, know when to keep going. I tended to not know when to leave it alone and to keep going. Hands. Uh, it's okay, oh, right? Okay. American style. It's okay. No, Kung Fu style is good. Well, I don't know, because I want super take. You know, what I called super perfect. He was the last to give in. He was the last to say, this is the best we're going to do, and let's move on. They can You're going to do better than that? Well, you have a good, you have a good end. Actually, you have, actually, you have a good end. You have a good end. Hold it. Good. Good. Yes, good. We have to see. You want to try one more? Yeah. Let's try one more. OK. He wants to try one more. If you do one, you do two. If you do one, you do two. Two more. He's a perfectionist, and he felt that there was something special about the, the whole experience, the whole picture, the whole everything, and he wanted to get it as right as possible. <laughs> Keanu, of course, wasn't satisfied. It had to be super perfect. Cut. Eight days till Dojo. Eight days, that's an eternity. That's an eternity. <laughs> The idea was a, a traditional Japanese style building, or at least that influence set up for fighting. The dojo, in fact, had been built well before we actually were going to shoot. And because of the injury to um, Keanu Reeves' neck, we couldn't actually film that set. So the actors had rehearsed in it for about a month beforehand. This is the moment. Kung Fu have meaning and they are very specific. It is a dance and Wu Ping is very exacting. And I think a lot of times that the brothers were looking to Wu Ping for his, you know, seal of approval on whether or not we'd executed it the right way. Keanu and I were very much in sync with each other by that time. You know, we had been practicing these movements for like eight months, but we hadn't really gone full out until I think we got there. 
We were always concerned about the dojo scene. I was thinking they were going to get hurt. They thought they could do full contact. They'd kill each other. You could tell the actors were totally, totally into it. And Keanu's little ad lib of it, that thing, which is another one of those things that we didn't we didn't make up till the, the moment, the zoom on, the kung fu zoom on Keanu. Sort of the little magic things that happen. We did 21 takes of the three kicks. Keanu goes up, kicks me three times. And that was partly because he hadn't been up in a wire in a long time. There was no rehearsal time for him to go up. Should I try and jump up or just go straight? You should go straight. You know, he wasn't prepared for that that day. hard to see your friend be so hard on, on themselves. But that's just his, you know, you kind of have to leave room for people to do what they do, you know? And he's not, not always like that, but, you know, there's times you just, you know, your heart breaks because you just wish he wouldn't be so hard on himself. Yeah, good. All right. That was better kicking. I couldn't get the triple kick. I couldn't do it. I was in this harness and I was like mad and I'm screaming. I just can't fucking do this fucking kick now. Just something fucking. We'll just shoot on fucking Monday, okay, man? Cut. Good kick, right? Bad hands. Yeah. Got there on Monday. I think it was three takes. Triple kick. to be able to do this extraordinary kind of eagle flying kind of kick. And they used a heck of a lot of light on it. Incredible amount of light, uh, high-speed cameras. There's this great moment Lawrence had in the dojo scene where he comes over to, to Keanu after he's sort of knocked him back. Fuck! And we could tell that Lawrence was I got he's into this thing. He's and he st starts coming at him. Cut. The most surprising thing was that we hurt each other a little bit. You know, we, we bruised each other up pretty badly. When we were training, he had no contact, or he'd have light contact. And then there were certain moments where you had to have more power. You know, we weren't pulling. You know, we had been practicing these movements for like eight months, but we. You know, we hadn't really gone full out until I think we got there. I was surprised by what, what happens when you smash four arms with somebody that, that hard, that often. There's a sequence where I fly over him, do a backflip and land in front of him, and he turns and hits me. And I got a pretty good sternum shot there. After the kung fu, the dojo scene, and Lawrence and Keanu were both just covered in bruises. And Grapes and burns from the Tommy cut up and you know harness burns from the rope heart from the wire work. Hey. I just want to flip over and I want to keep my hands in and I want to kick back and I want to tuck. Okay. Yeah, his body is he's leaving from the spot that I'm stepping to make this week. And action! Yeah. 
到滅口亭，就唔會打落去噶啦。嗰啲少少嘅嗰嗰啲嗰啲瞓，好似啲瞓嘅感覺去嘅。Know what you're trying to do? I'm trying to free your mind, Neo. During、uh, the subway sequence, Leon and he got sick. We were in down coats in the summertime. It was a cold set. It was a damp set. What looks like a really simple scene just took forever and ever. The initial plan was, well, we'll go to a real subway station, and we'll film. And then when you looked at what had to happen in this environment, it became kind of obvious that we couldn't shoot in a real subway. The set was fantastic. I think it was actually part of an old wheat storage facility. There was a real train track which they kind of built a, a subway station around. Except、um, once you're in in a wire and,、uh, and you're stuck in the wire and in harness for a long time, the harness starts riding up, and it's got to be pretty tight. And I remember it squeezing my kidneys. If you do it right, they're fun. If you do them wrong, they hurt. Supposed to be at each other's. What are we doing? Directors. Yes. <laughs> okay. He's right in here. Where do you want these things? Just go up to like an inch away. Oh. <laughs> so don't put it to his tip. Right. Like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that area. Yeah, that's good. That's What does good. it look like right against his head? Just do that. Okay. That's not. That's pretty good. Good one, cut. Cut. When we were shooting the subway scene, we had to really contact each other, really kick each other, really punch each other. There was there was major contact happening. Okay, you go. Cut. All right. And after the dojo, I realized that how we train and how we film are two different things because you have to have contact, and we had to start hitting each other. You couldn't just fake it because with the way they were shooting, you had to hit. Yeah, I find particularly taking the hits more difficult than delivering them. When you're taking hits, you feel like, well, between that hit and that hit, I want to actually get in another one. So I found that more difficult. <laughs> When the wire hits you, if you have your feet higher than your head, it's gonna it'll fuck you stiff. Jack, so have your feet lower than your head. I got to work with an exceptional stunt man and Chad Stahelski. When I speak about the fights and what, you know the action, I always I think of it as the two of us. I think that Chad comes in for when、uh, there's situations where、uh, you don't put an actor. You don't put an actor slamming into a wall, you know, upside down and drop ten feet. Chad did the upside down hit, and then after that, he had to do the ceiling hit where the subway's coming, 
Smith is on top of him. What happens when they came down, the other stunt man, I guess Chad was on the bottom. <laughs> and uh, landed on the one knee, and I think his knee broke, and his shoulder, tore ligaments his knees, dislocated his shoulders, broke some ribs. They had this contraption, the, the monster, which was a hydraulic air pressure. It kept driving people into the ground. So Darko went from the, he had to crash his new stand. That was very scary for everybody because we thought he maybe might have, you know, been very badly injured or perhaps even killed. And uh, we were really worried about that. And that was a horrible uh, evening for everyone. And then, fortunately, right toward the end, it was Larry's birthday, and his parents came, and uh, sort of the fog lifted for a couple of days, and we managed to get out of there. So I can get up, wife coming up, and look, I can get up, look at him. Yeah, get up, look, wife. Almost like the wife takes you straight in. Okay. <laughs> yeah, come on. Who's not in the fucking standing in the aisles at that point? <laughs> sitting in there thinking I was in an office block looking overlooking Sydney and there was this fantastic cyclorama of the Sydney skyscape it was completely real except it wasn't like the movie <laughs> it was really cool to be able to stand up on that floor and walk from one office to another office and another office and never once lose sight of the translator biggest translate in the world like that are you interested in a stat like that a little stat like is that is it the biggest translate the biggest one piece translate in the world yes it is josh we did uh, uh computer generate the translate so that sydney was not identifiable there's a few buildings in this background that are not where they really are because we're covering the opera house and we're covering sydney harbor bridge and i mean even though the movie takes place we're not saying it's not sydney it's just an unnamed city I'd like to share a revelation that I've had during my time here. The Smith prior to that scene's uh, totally in control, cold, doesn't show much emotion, if any. And during that scene, he starts to get, he starts to feel angry and feel frustrated because he can't get the information out of Morpheus. I hate this place, this zoo, this prison. He's starting to smell things and he's starting to be like a real person and he doesn't like it he doesn't like feeling emotions and he doesn't like being weak i can taste your stink and every time i do i fear that i've somehow been infected by it by all intents and purposes he would be partly human i suppose partly real <laughs> <laughs> I like to think that Morpheus is aware of everything that's going on in that scene, or at least he's struggling to maintain his awareness. Oh, it's actually about trying it's to just about hold just your mind, hold my mind in a place closed. where they can. Yeah. Uh, so I gotta. So I basically shut my my mind off. Yeah. Or I've drawn a curtain in front of the information that they want. There's another part of me that was really sort of sad that I didn't have any dialogue so that I could have a conversation with Agent Smith, so I could say that you know oh man i played this scene with hugo weaving it was great <laughs> but you know i did play this scene with hugo weaving and it was great find them and destroy them and uh, don't forget your line <laughs> oh that's right yeah. 
When the sprinklers went off and it poured into the room and we were all drenched and soaked and things were floating around and it was a kind of dangerous live wet set. And it was fantastic fun. I enjoyed, I enjoyed that week a lot. We had very difficult issues with the water. That was an early situation that the studio also was concerned. Do we need the water? Do we need the water? And the boys felt that the water was crucial. When the sprinklers came on and that's it, the water that came out of the sprinklers all had to be hygienic, you know, because there were upwards of 100 people up on that roof at various times, breathing in the water that was coming through the system and breathing out of it, obviously. It all had to become sterilized before it was kind of pumped back in. It all had to be heated. Uh, there were many little elements that kind of went into it. And you forget about the helicopter coming down and shooting Oh, oh yeah. Up. That entire helicopter rig, uh, which was a full-scale uh, helicopter, not a real one, but made lightweight by Owen, uh, and it had to operate in all axes and lift off and take off. The blades were all put in later by the visual effects people. Come on, honey, take us off. Hey, baby, you in there tight? I'm in there tight. So I get your bug in the road. Let's fly. Yeah. Or oh, you want me up like this? Uh, yeah. That's the one. That's the look. <laughs> no. It was very weird when I realized that it was all sort of rigged with explosives. You know, I had a moment's pause there. I kind of went, hey, who's responsible for this? <laughs> you know? Steve Courtley and his crew built into the floor 350 air-controlled nozzles, which would, when they set were filled with water, simulate the machine gun fire from Neo, who was hanging in a he helicopter just outside the window. And then you had that uh, shootout of the glass in a particular pattern. And as you arc around that, that's when you're arcing around the other wall to get Jones. There's a moment where you shoot everything, and then they cue the window. It was uh, mind-blowing. The glass had to be blown out. And the only way to make it safe for the actors is that the glass had to be blown out with by uh, pea shooters blowing uh, sand. Hundreds of them lined up out of frame. He's not going to make it. Ooh. It's kind of ironic in that to achieve what seems like a fairly simple thing to do, to fly a helicopter down the front of a building, shoot a window out, and rescue someone by jumping out the window. It's been over six months to actually achieve that whole element, because at the beginning of the film, we were shooting on a government roof. At this point, we're nearly the end of the film, and we're still shooting that same sequence. Trying to get the uh, Nebuchadnezzar finished for filming next week. There's always those final last minute adjustments we're going to do. I remember everyone was excited to walk on the Neb, the Nebuchadnezzar. That was really a cool day. It was exciting. It was like a new world going into a new, a new thing. And it was sad too because we had to say goodbye to the wire team. It's heavy. And the Neb, it's crawling with sort of Jeff Darrow sort of technology, which almost has this organic quality. It's this sort of industrially jungle. gadgety jungle cables and everything. You know, it's built long before the movie takes place, so it's an old ship. It's been around forever. It's just kind of been held together by the loving care of the crew. You just wanted to look old and put together and and not, uh, you know, not Star Trek-y where they're all components. They had to look like it was, they're constantly putting it back together and using pieces from this and that. And they really tried to bring the guts of the spaceship, if you like, out into the spaceship as opposed to burying it behind the sort of normal vac form sort of style thing that you might see in a lot of spaceships. Everything is considered. 
every, even the, the, the wires in the neb, there was, you know, the blue and red wires, arteries, and veins, you know, representative of this kind of, you know, living tissue in this steel ectoskeleton, you know. That ma ma marriage and of, uh, of machine and man everywhere in the picture, everywhere. It's almost Chinese, Sanskrit. It's not even numbers, it's weird. It almost become other characters. That's the right. Screen drops on a screen effect. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of work been gone into buying various old dentist chairs from the 1920s, which we have taken ideas from for making the ecto chairs. And take it right down to the canal, please. And I loved the chairs, and I loved, you know, the whole, the, the brutalness of that, of that needle that goes in your head, you know, the crudeness of it. You wanted to know what the Matrix is, Neo? The masculine side of Morpheus is really evident in the Matrix, and his feminine side is evident in the Neb. Try to relax. I wanted him to feel like a den mother almost. I just think if she's just more, maybe feminine even, because she's really kind of, you know, warrior-like in the Matrix, and then in the Neb, she's more of a woman, I think. Sentinel, this is what we're looking at. How? As soon as you see that thing go, yeah. you would say now. And my hand is on here, and I pull this out at the same time. I say now and then push. Pull. Thanks, guys. Bye. Is it before the now or after the now? It's before after the now. It's after the now? How does she know I'm back? She's very active. So it's not because of my eyes? No, nope. why not? I don't want to see your eyes open. Dark. How, if she pulls the plug, how does she know I'm back? She knows. Is there any cue from over phone? Is there? How does she know? She knows. Sure, if you want. Do you want to grab it? Sure. I want it to break. No. <laughs> Is he back? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rehearsal and action. Bang, bang, bang. Bang, bang, bang. Action. Zach, no. 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 Kill. <laughs> I just want to go on record saying it's disgusting. We're proving our love for our babies right here. Maybe not acting enough. Bring the baby up. Originally, when they were talking about the power plant, and Jeff was in France drawing it, and Larry gets the first fax. It was a lot more scary than he had imagined. They wanted it to look like it was something that would get away from that stainless steel, very uh, clean, science fiction-y look, and to make it look, you know, kind of dirty and used and ugly. Before we actually shot the pod, we had shot it about seven times, mainly on video, but the stunt guys have had to get inside it to see how the breathing mechanism would work. The special effects guys have to test how their skin's broke. The prosthetics man had to deal with all of these little pieces that prop guys had made. I feel bad for Darko, who was doing some of the tests. And he had, originally when they put the goo in there, they didn't heat it. And he had hypothermia in like eight minutes. OK, let's get him out of there now. Thank you very much, Darko. By the time the actor got in there, they figured out they should heat it up. Give him another one and let him get out of his arms.
this court or that court and that court? All three? I can't no. do all three. Not that much, but out is I'm good. I'm going to do all three. Have I? That's yeah. good. That's good. And action. Light. I mean, we were shooting the end of the movie, and he, you know, he had lost a lot of weight, and he shed another 15 pounds for the end of the, uh, the pod sequence there. I mean, I wanted to look very, you know, emaciated when I came out of the pod and went out on the table to recovery, and I, I think we got the effect there pretty good. He shaved everything, you know, his head, his eyebrows. The thing about that is just people I found when I would have conversations with people, they would be kind of like, uh-huh. Uh -huh. And I'd be talking to them, and they wouldn't look at me. It's weird. Now! Go! It kind of felt like we just sort of crashed to the end, you know? It wasn't a graceful end. We, we just were trying really hard to get everything done. Hey. Thanks, folks. That completes principal photography on the Matrix. Hey. I remember distinctly feeling very tired and very relieved at 1.01 in the morning when we ramped, which was Neo's number, by the way. I remember like walking from my from work and you know they do the whole thing and they say it's a picture wrap, you know. And it's so intense. I mean, it was just crazy. And I was walking back to my trailer and I remember saying to myself, I will never care this much again. Because it's too painful. It took me months to get over it. <laughs> and people were like, let it go. Let go of the matrix. I was like, I can't, I can't. Such an amazing experience. Well, we've been shooting for 25 weeks, 118 days. It's like, okay, when are we starting? Okay, and when are we supposed to finish? Okay, and I'm just committed for all of that, you know? I've never really been able to break it down. I think that has to do with my experience on Apocalypse Now, which was the other never-ending film. You know, you don't expect any film to be as successful as The Matrix was, so I guess we hope everyone that you work on will be, because, you know, you put... You kind of die a little bit every time you finish a film. You know, you leave a lot behind. Editing is all about, it's a cumulative process, and it's all about trying different things, taking things out, putting things in, you know, taking two steps forward and one step back, being not glued into your ideas, being open to what the film wants to be. There's always a, um, a core that they're working around. There's a, there's a moment in each scene where there's a, there's a shot that's so clearly designed as a key spot, and, and the scene leads up to that point, or it comes down from that point, but it really gives you something to work around. It gives me something to work around as the editor. The way a shot's typically set up, you show up and there's only one shot. That's the only shot they're interested in getting. And you look for it. Uh, you take the finder and they look for it and you can spend a long time, a lot longer than most crews are used to, looking for that shot, working it out, getting it right. But it's so time efficient because that is the shot. You don't have to come up with other coverage. This shot leads to the next shot. And you only have to shoot exactly what's being used. They just shoot what they need, which is very economical. And also, you know, it's fun to watch it, because when they shoot it, you see what you, it seems going to look like, and you see what you're going to get. We had visual effects companies in Sydney and in the US. Mannix is the main company out of San Francisco, but we had two companies, Animal Logic and D-Film, in Sydney that did a significant amount of visual effects. Mannix, I gave almost all the creature work went there and the bullet time type stuff. Animal Logic, I gave them a big climactic code hallway and like the exploding agent. D-Film tended to do difficult compositing. Things like when Neo jumps off the skyscraper and they did the helicopter crash and things of that nature. Early on, the studio wanted to try to get us to take out the helicopter scene. They thought we didn't need to add that as well. And of course, we were passionate about the whole sequence. They, they eventually agreed. Well, the helicopter crash is, I guess, one of the big money shots for the film because it's just so outrageously complex and so just visually intense that it's really trying to be the 
definitive action sequence, or at least that's our interpretation of it. So the combination of miniatures with live action, with stunts, with CGI, it's just uh, it's a very big, big sequence. We were very specific and we wanted the glass to explode in sort of an ever-expanding circle and to actually figure out how to make the glass do that and to figure out basically what glass to use and what explosives to use probably took three months of heavy-duty research. This was basically concentric rings put behind the glass with pyro charges that were all triggered to a certain timing. One. We built a, a you know a 25-foot square glass wall to scale of these windows. We built a quarter-scale helicopter with its blades and was mounted to a large crane arm. That was the very first thing that we started doing in 1996, and that was one of the last four shots that we finished in the movie. And uh, you're working the entire time towards making it perfect, and all the little pieces, there are a million little pieces that were invented to make that make sense. We had virtual backgrounds, which were ways of of literally photographing the real world with still cameras and extracting from the stills both shape and texture and then making a CG construction out of that. Once we've reconstructed it, now we can move your virtual CG camera around anywhere in that set. It's used to basically put together backgrounds for shots where we could never have conceivably shot it with a camera. You know, if you'd have done this with a camera, you'd have seen camera track, rails, rig, crew, people. This allows us to go in there, like take the stills when the set's empty, and then build the whole set artificially, in effect. And you get a photorealistic set. Everything begins with the simulation, and uh, all the math for how to shoot it works backwards from there. In this particular rig, there are 120 cameras and two motion picture cameras set up. We analyze what real frames we have, and we can create new frames of moments in between the captured frames to make moves uh, longer or stretch them out or do time compression effects. These are like uh, tests trying to find the uh, texture of the pod. The whole sort of like look of uh, a lot of the computer graphic creatures and environments is based on undersea life. They're much more light absorbing and sc scattery light and wild colors and things like that, which uh, no other creatures to date really have this kind of quality. Everything else is every, out in the sun or in like, you know, whatever, normal lighting, traditional lighting. How about, um, you got like, shit, let's see some pods. This is all computer graphics. It's like the, we're just talking, the babies yeah. grow inside there. And it's sort of like um, Big Daddy Roth meets uh, Jacques Cousteau. Just to uh, bring the animation until like there, yeah, and then cut it off. Okay. So you see, it's all fake. It's no real babies. Totally harmless. I believe in film as a visual medium, first and foremost. I think sound, meaning sound effects and music, are incredible, powerful tools. Easy, Neo. Easy. Take the 
touch me. Get away from me. Stay away from me. But I think ideally the film should stand up on its own. So I'm a big fan of at least through the very first cut, keeping the film pretty raw and pretty naked. So you can watch it and get some rhythm from it by a, without the help of music and effects. Easy, Neo. Easy. Get this thing out of me. Get this thing out of me. Don't touch me. Get away from me. Stay away from me. Because music and effects are always going to make the film stronger. But you don't want them to become a crutch. At least without knowing they are going to become one. Sometimes you say, I need that crutch. <laughs> I am uh, a sound designer, supervising sound editor. It basically means uh, I'm responsible for coming up with all the noises in the movie. This will feel a little weird. You know, obviously there were a lot of definitions in that movie about the nature of reality, and so I had to make a lot of definitions about the nature of the sound that defined reality or, or non-reality. No one's familiar with the sound of a squiddy. No one's familiar with the sound that the Neb makes. We were watching dailies and there was the, the incredible shot where the camera is pulling over the fetus, or not the fetus, the baby that was in the pod and it's filling up with water and the camera is pulling over it and then the valve closes up. As the first take of that came up, they made this like chunk sound effect with, the, with their mouths. You know, it's to them like they had the sync track in their head running. It's, it's usually a pretty good guide as to what it has to achieve. You know, that, that thunk was about 45 different sounds all put together, you know? Everything from plunger sounds to, you know, whacking a tire really hard and reversing it. You know, there's all kinds of crazy, like, toilet-type sounds in there, and, you know, but in the end, it had to just be thunk. We recorded it for all of the fighting whooshing, which is an important part of it, which in the Hong Kong films is it's usually fairly simple. You know, it's the same kind of whoosh over and over again. Uh, we went to technical junkyards and collected everything that made any kind of sound when you moved it. And, you know, we brought all this stuff in the studio and uh, made every kind of whistling whoosh and, and, and pitched up, pitched it down and played with it and processed and just created uh, literally thousands of face hits and body hit sounds and, and arm whooshes and leg whooshes and all of this. <laughs> Trying to always have that very earthy, very brutal, very musical quality that those Hong Kong films had, you know. But I also wanted to give it a, a kind of definition and articulation that they never had time to really put into it. It wasn't really until I saw the movie that I saw how important that uh, the concept of reflections were uh, as far as the Wachowskis were concerned. Almost every scene has some kind of aspect of, of a reflective subtext. When Trinity first encounters Agent Smith, she's sitting on a motorcycle and she sees him in the rearview mirror of her motorcycle. You know, almost every time when Lawrence Fishburne is on the screen in his dark glasses, you see Neo reflected in his glasses. You know, the scene with the spoon, the spoon moving around, it's always got somebody's face in it. I think I was able to take that, that ball and run with it and, and use reflections in the orchestra, you know, uh, of one section against the other or just a contrapuntal idea of place one on top of the other that would represent this re reflection that we see on the screen. And that, that's really, that was really the key to it for me. We all pretty much agreed that, that an organic, orchestral, and choral uh, approach was the best for the music. And then, and then we could enhance that with, with some additional synthesizer and sampler elements. And then, you know, whatever sequences had the protagonist, we could shift the emphasis onto the orchestra. When the machines were taking over, we could shift the emphasis toward the synthesizers. And it really worked pretty well. The fact that it was fairly seamless going from the underscore to the songs was mostly due to the sensitivity of the directors and also the music supervisor, Jason Bentley. The process uh, was a combination of, of understanding what the Wachowskis were interested in. They had the, the core interests of Rage Against the Machine at the end was just spot on. They couldn't do without it. Uh, furthermore, Prodigy was important. They're watching you, Neil. Who is? 
please just listen. That was a natural connection. Was the, the some of the some of the concepts in the film uh, very much match this uh, future-minded mentality that a lot of the producers in electronic music really subscribe to. There's this record on there, Rob D, Club to Death, which is an awesome tune. It's a surging, thick hip-hop breakbeat with uh, strings. Basically, that's a record straight out of my crate. I mean, just like these records around me. Just one of those gems that no one knew about. It was just one of those gems, you know, and you drop it, you play it at, at just the right moment. But, you know, a DJ usually keeps them because they're like secret weapons. We're in. And then we, you know, began to kind of just get it all done. And it was, you know, as usual, it was a rough ride because there was just visual effects that weren't coming in in time. And we had to do TV spots and a trailer and we needed visual effects in the trailer and they weren't ready yet. I mean, just it's a whole, it's always a, a whole, you know, tense, tension-filled moment when you're preparing to release a movie. In the last week of mixing, I took out two frames <laughs> because the visual effect had come in and it wasn't exactly what I thought it was going to be. And I felt that this cut wasn't quite right. I figured this is the end. This is what's going to be there forever now. And I wanted it to be right. I remember me and Lorenzo sat down and they showed us the picture and it was just, I mean, we were so just out of our minds. I was completely blown away by it. I just. It was, it exceeded my expectations. Um, I could, I knew then that we were going to be a success. The first time I saw it with an audience uh, was a thrill for me. It was just uh, the excitement that ran through the audience. The fact I sat down in the audience and I could feel them going with it. I could just feel them following the beats that we'd put in there. They were with them all the way and there was applause halfway through. There was a standing ovation at the end. I remember being completely blown away with Carrie Ann's first, the whole opening sequence, because I hadn't seen any of that, and how powerful that was, and what a great opening that was, and how Trinity was, how Trinity worked really well. I'd never seen myself in a movie before, and so I had a really hard time. It just, all I could see was everything I felt I did wrong, and I just was like cringing at every, everything I said, and you know, it was just really, any time I came on, I just had to do this. Two things happened to me when I saw the film. First was that I remembered suddenly all the philosophical and spiritual lessons that are layered throughout the film. I had completely forgotten about that. Um, and Morpheus scared the shit out of me. It was much more suspenseful than I thought it would be. <clears throat> uh, I found it very moving. I was just amazed that, uh, that they did what they set out to do. When the film was coming out and then, you know, we'd hear stories about people going, you know, more than once, twice, three times, nine times, ten times, eleven times. And then some of the emails that they, they were getting and some of the responses onto the, the film's website. And then when we heard, you know, people dressing up as characters, and, um, I didn't expect that at all. Oh, yeah, I ran into people who were complete Matrix freaks. The hollow stuntman I just worked with who just recited every line of mine back to me all the time and I couldn't believe they'd seen The Matrix so many times and, you know. And what, what was really gratifying to me though is, um, you know, I'll be taking a taxi someplace or I'll just be in some non-movie situation and it'll come up that I edited The Matrix and people will want to talk to me about it. People want to tell me about how much it changed their lives or how much they saw the world differently or and that that to me personally is so exciting to be you know a small but significant part of a movie that can affect people on that level that that's what success is to be in one film like that in your lifetime makes you extremely lucky it's right extremely fortunate to be involved in a project like that i've had the good fortune of being involved in two with Apocalypse Now, which is not the commercial success that The Matrix is. Domestically, it grossed about $171 million, which is an enormous amount of money, and about $270 million foreign. So it 
we're looking at a $450 million grossing movie, which is, in terms of Warner Brothers, it's the highest grossing film they've ever had. For Warner Brothers, it's done a great thing for our studio, which is uh, the hardest thing to do, which is to have a great reputation for going cutting edge and innovation, and they really brought it to our studio. I hope they never leave. I didn't go to the awards. I just didn't think we'd win anything. A couple years ago, I had the same, essentially the same four nominations for a movie we did called Die Hard. And we had the same nominations and won none of them. I had the good fortune to be at that um, Oscar award ceremony. And uh, it was fantastic to be in the audience and, and uh, to have you know, the film announced. I went into the, that evening at the Academy Awards thinking I had a shot, but thinking I wouldn't win. And I was, I remember saying to my wife at one point, sitting next to me, I said, it's really boiling in here, isn't it? And she says, no, it's really pretty cold. <laughs> the air conditioning's up full tilt, I'm freezing. <laughs> Getting the award was completely matrix light, like unto itself, just because, you know, you walk up there and it's, none of it seems real in any way, and you're looking at these lights and, and, but then you go through the curtain and it's exactly like leaving the matrix and going into the real world. It's just, all, you go through these curtains and everything's all black, there's all these people dressed in black, you know, tuxedos. Uh, with wires and gaffers tape everywhere. It was just this completely like rigged, dirty, crazy world. It looked exactly like the world that the people in the Neb lived in, you know? Whereas up there on the, on the stage was this manufactured world that I got to be in for a moment. So that parallel was almost too much for me. It was almost a, a total breakdown. It was sad that, uh, that at least, I think Bill Pope and Owen Patterson both got at least should have been nominated for I mean, if you believe in awards or not. But I thought they should have at least been nominated for what they did. I wish we'd gotten more nominations. Maybe we would have won more awards. But it won awards across the board. It won awards in England. It won all the, 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 the crafts in L.A. The sound people gave it an award. The editing uh, union gave it an award. It, just, it, it, just, it was just a miracle that it worked so well. The idea is that we're going to make both these movies, Matrix 2 and 3, at the same time. It's not as if we're shooting them back to back because it's one giant movie that will then be cut in half and they'll be shown in, in two sittings. Everybody calls these things sequels. But from the first time when we were working on Bound and Larry and Eddie told me about The Matrix, they always thought of it and presented it as a trilogy. And so these, are, these next two movies are the second and third parts of a trilogy by which it's really important to see the difference because these movies will be able to watch, you'll be able to watch all three movies together and see one big story. It's the same antagonist, it's the same heroes, um, but you might as well call it Matrix Square and Matrix Cube because I think those are the levels it's going to. The Matrix was uh, an undertaking. This is a super undertaking. <laughs> now we gotta hide things and Got to be careful because people are constantly looking over over their sh shoulders. Because there's a lot of stuff in the movie that if it gets out, it'll ruin. It'll probably get out eventually, but I, I just hope it doesn't because it'll just ruin the, the surprise. It's been a very difficult task to mount these movies. I mean, they're enormously expensive, which is always an issue. And of course, Lion Andy are doing things that are groundbreaking again. I could jump right to the chase and tell you. <laughs> you know, that we're going completely over the top from where we were before because, uh, you know, the technology is there now to go for the next levels. There's stuff in this movie that nobody's ever done or seen, and uh, it's just, as much as I liked the first one, when I read the second one, I thought it was better than the first one. Then when I read the third one, the third one's better than the second one. So, I mean, it's, it's they're gonna be, hiring because they're just so amazed there's so much stuff to take in i really like it i like i like the revelations i like i like what neo finds out about he found out what the matrix was to a certain extent and in this piece he gets uh, even more insight into how the matrix works well this time we know the end of the story and this time we know what worked and what didn't work. I'm really anxious to see what the look will be in the real world in the next two pictures. That, I think, will be probably, or has the potential to be something really, really interesting. 
You know, you should study up on your Hegel and Kant and Descartes and Judeo Judeo-Christian traditions and all the different things that are going on because it's explored in the second and third movie. And when you see them as a whole, um, I think you will find there is a philosophical overlay to this entire thing that is um, quite profound. It's very rare that you actually get to merge what you do with what you believe in. And, and uh, The Matrix has so many principles that I, that I, you know, that I dig, so I think people are going to love it. Five kicks this time. Five kicks. Is there five? Last time was three. Last, last time they won three, but I said four. This time I won. They said five, so I don't know what we're going to do. I might have to do this. No, I don't know. We'll let you know. To be continued. The end. <laughs>